Russia has deployed a large amount of its military to Ukraine. Mapping them isn't very easy or straightforward, especially as they've been redeploying them after pulling out of Kyiv, Sumy, and their other offenses in the north. But every single army of the Russian ground forces has participated in some way in this war. At the start, we had the 1st Guards tank army deployed near Belgorod and fought for Kharkiv and Sumy, the 2nd and 41st Combined Arms Army in northeastern Ukraine, later heading across toward Kyiv, the 5th and 29th in Belarus, the 6th fought in Sumy, Kharkiv, and eastern Ukraine, the 8th in the region of Donetsk, the 20th east of Kharkiv, the 35th and 36th in Belarus, and formed the main bulk of the forces that advanced on Kyiv, the 49th began near Krasnodar, later moving toward Kherson, and the 58th from Crimea seizing Kherson. Of the four coastal troops of the Russian Navy, three participated. Elements of the 14th Army Corps fought near Kharkiv, the 22nd near Kherson, and the 68th in Belarus. Interestingly, it's been reported that the other, the 11th Army Corps, could not participate because of conscripts refusing to serve. That is, however, from a Ukrainian source, so it has to be taken with a grain of salt. That article also mentioned the 79th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade, which hasn't existed for a few years now, when it was reformed into a regiment. So, Russia has troops all over. And this leads us into this week's sponsor, Commando Store. They stock military gear from the last Cold War, and they probably will from this one too in the future. They're always getting new military surplus that's functional, durable, and historically significant. Unlike other surplus shops, their gear is sorted by its native size and graded for condition, giving collectors and active users a better idea of what to expect when they buy. They also commission reproductions of gear that's no longer available, like the West German Polizei bomber jacket, the South African waxy boot, and a whole assortment of other cultural artifacts and accessories to match. With classic surplus drying up worldwide, Commando Store makes it a core value to preserve the historical and cultural significance of these era-defining artifacts, and to offer them at a higher quality level than the average dusty surplus warehouse. You can go over and follow them on social media, but their mailing list is the best way to keep up to date with their ever-changing inventory. And if you sign up now, you'll get a code for some free snacks from their store. Just pay shipping. They'll send you around 4 or 5 emails a month letting you know what's in stock, where it came from, what the history is, and some bonus humor. You won't want to miss out on rare surplus, limited run reproductions, or their off-the-wall sales. So go over now and check them out. Also, sign up for that mailing list at commandostore.com slash covercabal. As the war in Ukraine went on, Russia is reported to have lost several generals. These include the 41st Combined Arms Army Deputy Commander, also the Chief of Staff of the 41st, Commander of the 29th, Commander of the 8th, Deputy Commander of the 8th, as well as another Commander of a Division of the 8th, and finally the Commander of the 49th Combined Arms Army. Although it is worth noting that many of these are unconfirmed and disputed by Russia. Other forces took part too, such as GRU Spetsnaz Brigades, the VDV or Airborne Forces, Aerospace Forces, which includes their Air Force and Air Defense, the Rose Gavaria or their National Guard, and the Russian Navy, most notably their Black Sea Fleet. The most famous now of that Black Sea Fleet being the Muscova, which was a Slava-class cruiser. Ukraine claims to have hit the ship with two Neptune anti-ship missiles on the 14th of April. Russia never confirmed that, instead they just state that a fire burning on board the ship eventually detonated munitions and seriously damaged the ship. After trying to save and tow the ship back to port, it sank. The Neptune is a small missile with a warhead of only 150 kilograms. In theory, it really should not have been able to sink such a large ship. But a lucky hit could impact a vulnerable spot, or you could get lucky and detonate munitions on board, as Russia stated happened. Or even poor or slow response from the crew to put out the fires could still lead to the ship sinking, which it did. As far as defense, I've seen a lot of people talk about why the Russian warship was not able to shoot down or decoy those missiles. The Muscova, in theory, is more than capable of defending itself against anti-ship missiles. However, in the real world, things are a lot more complicated. The human factor is one of the greatest variables. The crew might not have been properly trained, or motivated, or tired and not as quick to respond. Intelligence reports might have led them to not expect any anti-ship missile attacks so they weren't on guard, which is actually what happened with Israel too in 2006. The INS Hennet was hit by a Hezbollah anti-ship missile. Israel did not expect such an attack, so their air defense suite was not turned on. There was also some weather going on, and it wasn't perfectly clear and calm seas, so that would have made it slightly more difficult to detect and track any threats as well. Maintenance is another huge one. The Muscova was supposed to be overhauled in 2016. However, that never happened due to a lack of funds. It basically sat in port without moving for four years, until finally it went through a scaled back maintenance period in mid-2020. It's possible that the radars, or missiles, or SeaWiz, or software controlling it all weren't as well maintained as it should have been, and caused it to fail. 
It reminds me of the USS Fitzgerald when it collided with a container ship. Court documents later revealed that the radar on board wasn't working properly, and that the operator had to repeatedly hit a button to refresh the radar display. Issues like these, for national security reasons, typically are not reported publicly, that is, until something tragic happens. So it could be much more common than we would expect. So there are many reasons that can come into play, beyond just the fact that, on paper, it was more than capable of shooting down two subsonic cruise missiles. The war in Ukraine could currently be thought of as having two different phases. First would have been the full-scale invasion attempting to seize nearly every major city in the country that went through March. Then April on, withdrawing and refocusing in eastern Ukraine. So lots of the armies have moved, or they're currently being moved to possibly be redeployed in the future. But right now, the biggest offensive is around Izum. Russia appears to be attempting to push south near Kramatorsk, possibly in an attempt to encircle and cut off what is believed to be at least eight Ukrainian brigades in securing the rest of the Donetsk Oblast. This currently includes Russia's 1st Guards Tank Army, as well as elements of the 20th, 35th, and 36th Combined Arms Army, and the 106th Guards Airborne Division. Securing that Donetsk Oblast could be a big deal. Not only might they be able to encircle a large number of Ukrainian forces, but also create a much more uniform front in the east and create a buffer zone for the breakaway regions. Being able to secure that region could also give them an option to call for a ceasefire to end the war and still claim some victory. From day one, Russia has been pretty vague about what their objectives are. However, one clear one has been to secure and protect the ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. So this could be a way out for Russia to still save face to some extent. Also, finally, you've probably heard by now a lot about Russian BTGs, or Battalion Tactical Groups, and you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned any. BTGs are Russia's deployable maneuver units. They are formed in a somewhat ad hoc manner, taking some of the best troops and equipments from brigades or regiments and turning them into BTGs. Due to the various states of readiness and the quality of equipment, there could be several BTGs formed from each brigade, while other brigades might just be able to scramble enough for one. This is also why the number of BTGs Russia has is always changing. In 2016, they had less than 100. Five years later, they were stated to have up to 170. It's been stated that roughly 100, or even possibly 120 to 130 BTGs have been sent to Ukraine in the war. How many of them they've lost is not clear. Some say as little as 10, others as many as 60. The real number is complicated for many reasons, such as the fact that Russia has been pulling out of the region of Kyiv, and some of those forces have not fully redeployed in the east yet, and many of the BTGs that sustained losses just cannibalize other BTGs, and they also receive new personnel and equipment to form new full-strength ones. So it's not straightforward. But going forward, now that the Battle of Mariupol is all but finished, Russia can begin to use those forces elsewhere, putting a lot more pressure on Ukraine. However, seizing Mariupol, as well as holding on to Kherson, and trying to take others like Sumy and Kharkiv have proven to be much more difficult for Russia. Taking large cities typically requires large numbers of forces, it can last months, and extremely costly. This is because the enemy could be hiding around any corner, or from windows or rooftops, just waiting to ambush you, unlike out in the open fields. So, how far Russia will continue to push through eastern Ukraine really depends on how long they want to drag out the war. If they continue moving further west, they begin approaching much larger cities, larger than Mariupol, which has taken more than two months to capture, and they still haven't fully taken it yet as of writing this. So, unless something changes, it seems unlikely that Russia will advance much further west than the Donetsk Oblast. But, we'll have to wait and see.